So we read before the prayer in Acts chapter 10, we started and, and got down to verse uh, number six, where uh, the, the Lord through an angel has appeared to this man by the name of Cornelius. And this man, as we have, have seen in, in the word here, is a, is, is a man that prays to God. He's one that gives alms, an alm by definition, is a gift that's been extended to the poor, so he's a giver. You know, some people give, but they don't give to the poor. And, and it's, 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 it, you're a true giver when you give out in, in, in public to the Lord, when, you know, when the Lord puts someone on your heart. And, 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 you know, you're always sensitive to give, not just when you're in an, in an assembly or, or when you've just gotten paid. And here's a man that's a, a man of prayer, and he's a man that, that gives alms. He gives gifts to the poor. And so they come up as a memorial before God. God's hearing this man's prayers. He's seeing this man's giving. But as we're about to find out, the man is not saved. So that ought to tell us something, that you can be a person of prayer and even a giver and be unsaved. And so here's this man. He's not saved, and the Lord is wanting, of course, for him to receive salvation. So he sends this angel to speak to him and says, hey, there's this man that you need to send for, and when you've sent for him, he'll tell you what you need to do. And that's what we see in verse number six, where he's, he says, call for Peter. Uh, he lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and devout soldiers, and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And so now they're going to head to go to this man's house, Peter, and um, to ask Peter to come and speak to him. Well, what they don't know is while they're getting this word on who to call for, that night Peter lays down to go to sleep, and the Lord speaks to Peter in a dream. And God is going to speak to Peter in a dream, and he's going to deal with Peter regarding what's getting ready to happen from the house of Cornelius. And what's really interesting about this story is that God has the ability to talk to both ends. You know, so many times we feel like the Lord has put something on our heart, not saying that he hadn't, and we go and we try to share a word with someone, they just, you know, it's, it's like he spoke to one end but not the other. Or maybe someone comes to you with a word, and they say, hey, I know this is the word the Lord told me to give you, and they give you a word, but it doesn't mean, it's, it doesn't even mean anything. It, like, it doesn't make sense. And then there are other times that someone will bring you a word, and you've been praying about something, you've been thinking about something, you've been processing a thing, and then someone shows up and just gives you this word. I've had this happen so many times. And that word is right spot on the very thing that you've been dealing with or praying about or processing. And you know that that word is confirmation. And that, that's just a word that's easy to receive when something's been confirmed. And so as the Lord is directing Cornelius to go send for Peter, Peter is, is being dealt with by the Lord this particular night in a dream. So let's look at how God is talking to Peter to prepare Peter for what's getting ready to happen with Cornelius. And it's all going to make sense here in just a minute. Just stay with me, all right? And this is Bible study, all right? We're studying Acts chapter 10 right now. All right. So, so, so watch this. We'll, we'll go to, uh, to, to Peter's scene now, verse number uh, 9. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And when he became very hungry and would have eaten... But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. So they get the food ready, and, he, and, and off he goes into a deep sleep and saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down at, uh, to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. It sounded like he was eating in Louisiana. Man, I remember one time I was on this um, rafting expedition, my wife and the kids, and we were rafting the Colorado River, and we had this guy that was, you know, responsible for telling us how to paddle. And it was supposed to be all these people show up. We were the only ones, so we had the guide and the raft all to ourselves. And, man, we going down the river, and this guy told so many stories, and every time he told a story, he would say, yeah, you knew they were from Vermont. 
Then he'd tell another story and he'd say, yeah, you could tell they were from, and he'd name another state. And he'd say, yeah, you could tell they were from. So at the end of the trip, I said, look, I said, you've been naming all these places. I said, how can you tell when someone's from Louisiana? He said, oh, that's the easiest one. He said, y'all got one thing in common. You only want to know one thing. He said, no matter what I point at as far as wildlife, y'all ask one question. How do you cook that? <laughs> I said, man, you got us pegged. That's what we do. We eat it, man. We eat everything. So anyway, uh, this, this Louisiana cuisine comes down to Peter right here, and, and, and it's all manner of fowl and creeping things. I mean, fowl, that means he's eating some duck, creeping things. He got some crawfish, wild beasts. He's eating some deer. I mean, so, I mean, it, it, it's, it's all kind of stuff right here. Four-footed beast of the earth, had a little pork, a little hog. And so, anyway, there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, Peter's a Jew, and Jews don't eat pork. And, and, and so Peter, verse number 14, said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean or from Louisiana. Can you imagine Peter eating crawfish? Right? And so, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. What God has cleansed, don't call it common. And if you go back and look at the vision that he saw, this, uh, this meal was descending from heaven, not ascending from the earth. And so this is, this is something that was coming from God, and he's, and he's, and he's given this picture that this is a meal that I have cleansed. This is a meal that has come from me. And don't call what I have cleansed common or unclean. Verse 15, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. If I have cleansed it, no, no matter what your backstory has taught you, no matter what your, your, your uh, uh, experience has taught you, no matter what your upbringing has taught you. Don't call what I've cleansed common. Now, it looks here in this, in this story, in this dream, that the Lord is speaking to Peter to accept food the Lord has cleansed. But the Lord is teaching Peter a bigger lesson because he's got to prepare him for what's getting ready to happen at his door. And what's getting ready to happen is a Gentile by the name of Cornelius is going to be sending men to Peter's house for Peter to come to Cornelius' house to tell Cornelius and his family how to be saved and to share the gospel. But Cornelius, being a Gentile and not a Jew, is going to be something new for Peter because he's got to break the hold that his past has on him that he doesn't have any dealings with Gentiles. And so the Lord is showing him that when I've cleansed a man, don't call him common. And, and, and isn't, that, isn't that a beautiful picture of Jesus that when we all entered into Christ and, was, and we have been washed in his blood and have been redeemed by his blood, it doesn't matter what, what our ethnicity or what our background or what our experience or what our education or what our social status or our class, all those things that come as a part of our natural life, they're a mute point when we enter into the kingdom of God. And no man should call one that is born again common. Amen. Amen. There shouldn't be a respect of persons with God anyway. And we're going to look at this in the Word to continue from last week's study. But there certainly shouldn't be a respect of persons for any person that has entered into the covenant of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because no matter what you may look like or no matter what your backstory might be, you are my brother and you are my sister in Christ. Once you receive Jesus Christ, we're in the same family. And, and I, know, I know I didn't misread Revelation chapter 5 that tells me the scene of heaven. When we worship the King of Kings, when we worship the only one worthy, the one to whom we will sing the song of the redeemed to, Revelation 5 tells me that every tongue, every kindred, all families, all nations were represented around the throne. So if you have a problem accepting people that don't look like you on earth, you're going to be in for a shock when you get to heaven. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And so... The Lord has to deal with Peter through this uh, uh, metaphor, this picture of a meal, not to call anything that he's cleansed common. Verse 16 says, this was done three times, and the vessel was received up into heaven. 
Now, while Peter doubted in, his, in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So here he is wondering, Lord, what are you trying to tell me in this vision? And then lo and behold, here come some Gentiles about to knock on the door. Verse 18. And they called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. And that's what I'm telling you. It's awesome when the Lord brings confirmation of something he's already uh, put on your heart or something that you're already praying through and processing. And then all of a sudden now th 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 this thing comes. And I, I could tell you so many times I've seen that happen in my life. And, 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 and that confirmation is a beautiful thing. And, and, and I've gotten it many times and sometimes I hadn't. So don't, 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 you know, don't think that it's going to happen every time. Many times, you know, we'll, we'll just be led in peace and go forward with Joel. But it's always a beautiful thing when God sends this confirmation like he did Peter right here. And so, verse 21, Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause whereof you are come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, it just means he was over a hundred men, a just man, and one that fears God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, because he's not a Jew, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear words of thee. What you say? He said he's been told by the Lord that he needs to hear words of you. That he needs to hear words of you. Peter. Now, I, I got to just stop just for a second and inject this. Because the only reason he has sent these men to Peter's house for him to come and speak words was because an angel showed up and told him to do so. So I don't know about you, but when I read this, I think to myself, or I, or I have thought to myself, okay, an angel was already there. An angel was already telling you what to do. Why didn't the angel just go ahead and say, Oh, by the way, Cornelius, one name Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. And if you call upon the Lord, he is rich to all those that call upon him in faith. So call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. And then you will have true salvation that doesn't necessarily come through prayers and giving alms. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through his son Jesus. Why didn't the angel who was already there speaking to Cornelius tell him that? I'm going to tell you why. Angels have not been anointed or ordained of God to preach the gospel. God has given that mandate to you and I. We have been given the mandate to preach the gospel. And if man doesn't preach the gospel, then it just won't get preached. So we can't pray and say, okay, angel, I send you to go touch Miss Johnson and lead Miss Johnson to Jesus. No, you got to go pray for Miss Johnson and lead Miss Johnson to Jesus. And if your name is Miss Johnson and you already say, I wasn't talking about you. But, but my point is that sometimes we want to send angels to go do errands for us and go do the work for us when it is you and I that have been called, equipped, and sent to preach the gospel. And that's what the Lord is demonstrating here because the same angel that's telling him to call for Simon could have told him, call on Jesus, but angels have not been given the authority to preach the name of Jesus to the lost. That mandate has been given to the church. It's been given to you and me. Amen. That's just a little side note, but it's a, it's, it's a powerful one. And so he, 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 they call Peter to come, and they say, We've been told that we're supposed to hear words of thee, verse 22, now to verse 23. Then called he them in and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied them. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and he called together his kinsmen and their friends. Man, we got somebody coming you got to hear. So we got the kinsfolk together and got near friends together because this man was coming to bring them words from God and they want, he wanted everybody to hear. So the, the, the place is packed out, full house. Verse 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. 
But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Here we go. You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation or another ethnic group. You see that? It's un it, it, let, me, let me put it to you like this. It's uncommon. You know, it's uncommon. It's, it, it, it's not customary. It's not traditional that a, a, a Jew be found in a Gentile's house or for a Gentile to be found in a Jew's house. Now, you just have to bring that into uh, our nation. You just have to bring that into your culture or your upbringing. And, you know, and, and, and to think about how divided people are over this and over that. All right, it's more than skin color. There's so many things that divide the human race. We'd be here all night talking about the things that divide us. But, but notice, I think we can relate to being in such a divided culture where so much is based on appearance and identity, where, where we're really in this culture being taught that we are to be judged by the color of our skin, and that is, that is, that is not just wrong, it's sin to think that you could judge somebody by the color of their skin, or that is right to judge somebody by the color of their skin. Now, whether you accept that or not, I can't help you. You know, as far as your position, all I can do is tell you what the Word says. And we're going to show you in the Word that to judge somebody by their appearance, to judge somebody, you know, based on some preference or, or some respect of persons is sin. Matter of fact, you can write this in your notes. James 2, 8 and 9 says this. If you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. Verse 9. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. But yet we're taught and have been all of our life to, 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 to judge people by appearance. And that's prejudice. It is pre the word prejudice means prejudgment. That's all prejudice means. It means prejudgment. So if someone walks into your company or your business or your life and you think you can size them up and know them by the color of their house, their skin. That's prejudgment. You've already made a determination about that person. Not based on, as Dr. King said, the, the content of their character. You've made a judgment based on the color of their skin. Whether that be white, black, yellow, red, green, whatever it may be. When you think you can look at a person and, and determine the end, make a prejudgment before you've heard that person speak, before you know their heart, before you know their work ethic, before you know their character, before you know anything about them, you size them up and say, I can't receive from a black man. I can't receive from a white man. Oh, I can't receive from a Hispanic man. Oh, I can't receive from an Asian. Oh, I can't receive from a Jew. The moment you judge somebody by their ethnicity and you know that person, you know nothing about them. All you know is, is, is what ethnic group they represent or what they look like. The Bible says you commit sin. It's sinful. It's not just wrong. It, God calls it sin. Can believers say amen? Because the world needs to hear this message. God, God, God is not going to judge us when we stand before him based on skin color. There's not going to be a white line, black line, Asian line, Heinz 57 line, Hispanic line, Indian line. Man was made in the image of God. And, 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 and everything that truly defines us is, is skin deep. And, and, and to judge somebody by their exterior appearance is prejudgment that's prejudice that's what prejudice means is prejudgment everybody amen we good all right and so peter is saying here you know there's a prejudice between jew and gentile but yet i'm a jew and i'm in your house even though there's a prejudice i'm in your house right now a Jew in a Gentile's house. That's what he's saying. But, he, but notice he said uh, in, in the latter part of verse number 28, watch this, latter part of verse 28, but God has showed me 
that I should not call any man common or unclean. So notice he's using the, the vision of the food that came down from heaven that I told you about earlier, stuff that normally a Jew would never eat is, is, is like coming down as if it's in a picnic blanket and it being dropped down right before Peter and Peter is seeing this vision of this food come out of heaven and Peter's told to eat it and Peter said, oh, my, 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 my first thought is no. And God said, oh yeah, you can eat this because I've cleansed this. Don't call this meal common no matter what it might look like. You're, 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 you're giving it a judgment, but you don't know why I've cleansed this food. And so the, the, the bigger picture was don't call a man common. Don't call a man unclean in and of himself. And so that's where we get the therefore in verse 29. Verse 29, therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for, I asked, therefore, for what intent you have sent for me. So what he's saying here is, I didn't, I didn't make any question about it. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't make any biased statement. I just want to know, what can I do? Why am I here? Why have you sent for me? What, 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 what's my purpose being here? But the Lord told me I couldn't come to you with any gainsaying because I'm not to call any man common or unclean. Now, if anybody here, watch this live stream, is guilty of making a prejudgment on someone, where you think you know someone because of what they look like or the color of their skin, and you make a judgment, and you don't even know that person, you don't know their heart, you don't know their character, you know nothing about them, you only know what they look like. If you make that judgment, you commit sin. And that's what the Lord is showing Peter right here in the book of Acts and, and, and Lord willing, if we have time, I'm going to show you that this is going to change the trajectory of what the Lord wanted to do with the Great Commission. And, and, and this, this had to be dealt with. As a matter of fact, when you study Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, the 11th chapter is nothing but a repeat of the 10th chapter. It, it, it would be like you having an amazing Tuesday, all you know, and you're on a trip, and Tuesday into Tuesday night, you had all these events. And then you go home Wednesday and tell your wife and kids about what happened Tuesday, and you spend Wednesday telling them about Tuesday. Acts chapter 11 is just a repeat of Acts 10, but Peter's letting all the disciples know of what happened to him in Acts 10 because what the Lord was showing Peter was not just for Peter. It was for all of the disciples to get this understanding. Does that make sense? They all needed to know what God was doing because this would establish the Great Commission where we have been told by the Great Commission to teach all nations in and, 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 and Matthew 28, all ethnic groups, Matthew 28. We're told to preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16. And then in Acts 1, when the Lord said the church would be in doubt with power, in verse 8, he says, you shall be witnesses unto me, listen to this, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. If you take just Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, Jerusalem, for the church to preach to Jerusalem, they would be preaching to people that are geographically and relationally close. That's, that's, it's easy to preach to people that are geographically and relationally close. So you accept the Lord, you got a neighbor, y'all been friends forever, you got the same recipes and the same culture, and so you go next door to tell your neighbor about Jesus, that one's easy. Geographically close, next door, relationally close, you've been knowing him for years. But then he said, go to Judea. Judea would be, uh, and Samaria would be geographically close but relationally completely disconnected. That would be like having somebody in your neighborhood, they live close, but y'all ain't nothing alike. And the Lord says, I want you to go minister to that person. You're like, who knew? We don't have nothing in common. We live close, but we don't share much in common. And see, that's the world we're living in because there's so many of us that we live in the same city, we live in the same neighborhoods, we go to the same schools, we shop at the same Walmart. There's so much that's the same, but there's a relational disconnect. And Jesus says in the Great Commission, I want you to reach them too. And then he says this, under the uttermost parts of the earth, and th those are people that would be geographically distant. I got to go a ways to get there. 
and relationally distant. Is this making sense what I'm saying to you? Well, the great, the great Commission could not be achieved if the early church and the disciples had a prejudice because they would never go outside of what's geographically and relationally close. They wouldn't go down the street. They wouldn't go to a different neighborhood. They wouldn't talk to somebody that didn't look like them. Why? Because they were stuck in the culture of prejudice and racism and preference where my preference is to find somebody that I can relate to. My preference is, is to only talk to people that look like me, understand me, have the same beliefs as me, and I got to break out of this preference shell for the sake of the kingdom of God and that's what God is doing through Peter right here yeah. hallelujah. hallelujah you wouldn't believe the people that I've talked to that, that, that'll say things to this nature oh uh, you know I appreciate what y'all are doing down there but it's just my preference it's just my preference to worship with fill in the blank it's just my preference God bless you, God bless you. It's just my preference. What are you going to do when you get to heaven? Do you think we're going to be divided when you get, when you walk into Pearly Gate and you got all these signs that divide us by skin color and tradition and culture and, and denomination that we just need to go find our preference? <laughs> Whew. So he says here, I didn't come with any gain saying because the Lord told me don't call anybody that he's cleansed common. And all man was made in the image of God. And there needs to be an honor and respect simply because of that for all people. All right, and that's what he said. What intent have you sent me? Verse 29. Verse 30, and Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting under this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. And he said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are, are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa. Call here the Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of Simon, a tanner, a man that works with leather, by the seaside. When he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately therefore I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now therefore we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. In other words, get on with it, boy, what you got to say? <laughs> Preach that word. Verse 34, now, now the man's been told... By God, Peter's going to preach the word to you. Peter's there. He said, look, man, I, didn't, I brought all these people together and then fed them these ribs for a reason, man. We, we, we hear what you got to say. And so Peter's now been asked to preach. And so verse 34 is Peter begins his sermon. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, like he had it right all along, of a truth. I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Notice what he said here. He said, uh, no, notice how he's saying it. He's saying it as if he's been having this conviction for as long as he's been alive. <laughs> well, let me just tell you right now that uh, the Lord has shown me that uh, he's no respecter of persons. But he's not telling him that, that just a, over a day ago, he's arguing with God about this very thing. But that's the power of conviction. Once the Lord gives you a conviction, you don't have to have had that conviction your whole life. Man, you can open your mouth and speak it like that thing's been in you forever. That's the power of the Holy Spirit planting a, a conviction deep on the inside of you. And I'm thankful here that Peter's preaching based on his conviction and not based on his experience or, or, or all that other, he's not, he's not clouding the message with his baggage. So many times, you know, and, 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 I, and I might have been guilty of this and be guilty. And Lord, Lord, forgive me if I have, and I don't want to ever be that way. But a preacher is, is, is certainly susceptible to clouding the message with his own mess. And we don't need the message clouded with, 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 with your own mess. And, and so Peter's not getting in the way of what God is trying to do here. He's just speaking in line with that conviction. He said, okay, I'm here to preach. Here's my first word. Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. I like that. No, God is no respecter of persons. It has no bearing on God what you look like. It has no bearing on God your ethnicity. He said he, said he has no respecter of persons. But in every nation or in every ethnic group, 
He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So God said, I'm not worried about what you look like. I'm worried about what you act like. Isn't that a word? Forget what you look like. What, forget where you came from. How are you living your life? God said, I, I, there, there's, a, a, there's an honor that the Lord gives to those who, who fear him, who honor him, and work righteousness. There's an honor that, that God gives. And that's that honor that Jesus talked about in John 8 when he said, why is it that you seek the honor that comes from man, but you don't seek the honor that comes from God only? I want the honor that comes from God only. And so Peter is saying here, the individual that, that will reverence God, respect God, fear God, work righteousness will be accepted with him. Verse 36, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. Oh, by the way, he is Lord of all, not just Lord of the Jews. He is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all of Judea, it began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Oh, here we go. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all the things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem who they slew and hanged on a tree. Him, God, raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead, to give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. Whosoever believes in him, it doesn't matter what your backstory is, it doesn't matter what you did last night, whosoever believes in him receives remission of sins. Man, that's powerful. Peter's preaching, y'all. He's preaching Jesus. I can't wait to see what happens. And I know it happened, but I want to see it again. Because, man, he's preaching Jesus. Verse 44, and this is what happens when you preach Jesus. While Peter yet spake, and we see what he's speaking, how God anointed Jesus, how Jesus died for our sins, how God raised him from the dead, how he's seated at the right hand of the God of the Father and will judge the quick and the dead, how that he is the one to whom all the prophets spoke of and that through him anyone can receive forgiveness of sins. While he yet spake that, preaching Jesus, watch what happened. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Ooh, what you say. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. What word? The word of who Jesus is. That's why you always need to be in a position to hear Jesus preach. That's why there's so much power when Jesus is preached because the Holy Ghost will always respond to the preaching of Jesus. He, he, won't, respond he won't respond to the preaching of man or the self-glorying of man. If I got up here and preached James McManus, Holy Ghost would never move in this place. He moves where Jesus is preached. And so while Jesus was preached, the Holy Ghost fell on everybody that was in the house. Verse 45. And they of the circumcision, that's Jews, which believed were astonished. These are believing Jews. They're astonished as many as came with Peter. Here we go. Because that on the Gentiles, folk that didn't look like them, folk that didn't have the same culture, folk didn't have the same backstory, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, can any man forbid water? 
Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? I wish I had known that scripture when I was 18 years old, when I was told by that deacon that I couldn't baptize that little boy. Because if I had known that verse, I'd have quoted it right in his face. Can any man forbid water? Can any man forbid water? And I love that statement. He's saying, how can you forbid these folk from being baptized even though they are Gentiles, even though they are not Jew? They have received Jesus. They have received his spirit. They are magnifying God. They should be baptized like anybody else. Amen. Why? Because God's no respecter of persons. Amen. Notice how the gospel is being presented here and the response to the gospel doesn't have anything to do with, 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 with all this. As a matter of fact, on the contrary, the gospel is being advanced despite the separation of ethnicity or nationality. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and then prayed they him to carry to tarry certain days. They wanted more. All right, go to chapter 11. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard, read it on the Facebook. Look here. And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard, here we go, that the Gentiles had also received what? The word of God. They heard, they heard that the Gentiles have now received the word of God. This is not just a Jewish thing. This has become a Gentile thing. Why? Because the word of God is to all people. Jesus is Lord to all that call upon him in faith. And so word got out that these Gentiles had received, notice, the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, Jew, contended with him. Can I just play with this for a minute without anybody getting offended? I'm, I'm going to go ahead and make this disclaimer. This, this might offend you, but I'm going to say it to bring it on home. Notice... In verse 3, they said, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised and did eat with them? You went to a white man's house? You went over to a black man's house? So I'm trying to bring this into what has our culture and our nation divided. It, because this may not mean a lot, Jew and Gentile, but when you bring it down to something that we're facing in our society, you, you can see what, what was being said here. Peter is being challenged because he went to someone that didn't look like him's house. You went to that church? Y'all know the stuff that's said. Y'all, I don't even have to repeat that foolishness. Because all kind of stuff is said. I never understood it early on. I never understood it. I would invite people to church and they say, ooh, no, we can't go there. I said, well, no, man, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't go to a, uh, a black church. I said, but, but wait a minute. What do you mean we don't go to a black church? Because I would already have had, had a conversation with, with, with black members. They said, yeah, it's hard to get people to come to a white church, black people to come to a white church. I said, white church, we got more black members than white members. They said, yeah, but pastor, you don't understand. If the pastor's white, it's a white church. I said, what you say? I heard all this because, man, the days of LSU and thereafter, man, it was my wife and I and my niece. We were only white members. It's the truth. And so you try to invite somebody and say, oh, man, I ain't going to no white church. And I said, white? Everybody black. <laughs> yeah, but it's got a white pastor. It's a white church. And so then you talk to white people. No, like, oh, it's hard to get people to go to a black church. I said, they got a white preacher. So I said, man, I don't know how this church ever going to grow because black folk won't come to a white church and white folk won't come to a black church and it's like we whatever color we ain't supposed to be. <laughs> man, the Lord moved and this, this ministry is history. If I had time to tell the story, it's supernatural because it wasn't ever supposed to be. It's been this way since day one. It was never supposed to be, but it's here. It's happening. It's real. And people ask me how it works. I said, the only people who won't come here are racist. That's who won't come. 
And there are some folk that have hate or division embedded in their heart that don't like you because you're here. And your being here is exposing something in them, and that's why you go through so much persecution for it. I was talking to somebody, I think it was you just the other day, about the persecution that Word of God members go through just for being here. And it's because it exposes something. Maybe anytime, I'm going to talk about this later. Anytime someone gets super critical of you, y'all don't deal with that, do you? And I'm not talking about Word of God members. I'm talking about anybody. There, there's a spirit of criticism that will cripple you if you don't understand it. And it, it, it bothered me to a point how critical Christians were to a point, and, and I'm going to just, just show you this because you can, you can download your copy or get your copy, but I wrote a book called Critical Condition. And I wrote this book because I just saw how dangerous criticism was in the church and how it was stopping relationships and it was preventing the gospel and handicapping the church because of the spirit of criticism. And the Lord gave me this when, regarding, regarding criticism, and I write uh, five or six chapters in this book, but five chapters just on this. That criticism, and I can save you having to get the book because it's going to be the, 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 the cliff notes, all right? But criticism is going to always be, in my opinion, based on one of these five things. When, so when you talk about people being critical of you, critical of your church, critical of your life, you can, you can sum it up to one of these things. And, 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 and by, by taking the, the word pride and, and make pride an acronym, P, the number one reason people are critical is through preference. In other words, most of the criticisms we face in life for our decision or where we go to church or what car we drive or what neighborhood we live in or what clothes we wear, most of the criticism that we face is just based on someone's preference. It, they don't have any foundation for being critical. There's, there's no fact. There's no truth. It just violates their preference. A lot, there's a lot of criticism that comes to me, even in, in this ministry, from people that you can't cite scripture that we're doing something scripturally wrong. It's just preference. Well, I don't know how we don't sing this. We have people stop by and dropping off songs and CDs and would you give this to so-and-so? We want to sing it. It just really boils down to preference. And people will try to spiritualize preference. But your critic, likely reason number one that they are critical of you is it just a preference. But people don't want to say to you, Oh, I know it's not wrong. I know it's right. It's just not my preference. No, people try to exaggerate preferences and make them spiritual and attack people that, that choose something that they don't prefer. And that's wrong. Just because that's what you have preferred doesn't mean that's what I'm supposed to prefer. The second one is resentment. PR, resentment. People that are critical of you likely resent you, at least some of them. And, and, that, and that's what, something I want to deal with for a minute because resentment, it can be something in you maybe that you've overcome that your critic has not overcome and they resent that you got victory in that and they're still struggling with it. So you got to be able to know that, you, you know, because otherwise your critics will keep you up at night. Those coworkers that are so critical, you're up all in the night, can't sleep, taking Benadryl and dried all up. Next morning came out and talk, you know, trying to sleep, getting over these critical people. Don't let critical people keep you up at night. That's why I wrote the book. I want to expose why people are critical. There's a reason why people are critical. They either, they, 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 it's just either against their preference or they resent something about you. And likely it's that you found a freedom they haven't found. So they resent it. You, you're exposing something in them. Because they know they need to get over some stuff that you already got over. And they hadn't gotten over things they need to get over. And when they get around you, it exposes that and they resent you for it. P-R-I. Your critic likely is inferior to you. People that feel inferior to you 
try to tear you down to get you down back to their level because you done went up. You done grown spiritually. You have matured. You're not that little uh, 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 immature teen adolescent anymore. You're not this little kid in a grown up body anymore. You have matured in the way you view relationships. You have matured in your walk with God. You don't just play church on Sunday. You're growing in the word. You're, you're applying the word to your life. It's changing you. Yes, your marriage may look different. Yes, your finances may look different. Yes, your children look different. But it's because of a maturity that you begin to grow in. And folk that wouldn't spend time in prayer, wouldn't spend time in the Word, wouldn't get disciplined in their life, have not matured, still play in church, don't like the fact that they've been in church longer than you, but you are outgrowing them spiritually. So what do they do? They try to get critical of you to tear you down to make themselves feel better. They got to find something wrong with you and just, just pound on it. This, you know why I wrote the book? I wrote the book because this was me. I was in critical condition. The ministry started growing and people started talking and tearing into me. I couldn't understand it. The Lord had to liberate me from people so that I could be who he called me to be. And he showed me these things and it's all rooted in pride, preference, resentment, inferiority. Your critic, many times, is just trying to be defensive. So when the critic has something in their life that they don't want exposed, they become critical of you to justify their own mess. So you done brought something to light in me that I don't want brought to the light. So I'm going to find some kind of way to blame you for what you've exposed in me to make this. I'm going to turn the table on you. You're going to be the one wrong. Yeah, I did that, and I know it's wrong, but I did that because you made me do it. It is ridiculous, but it's true. Ask anybody married. You got to roll it back. It's like you, you started this. You did that. You remember back when, when the, yeah, you did that. So the, I'm, I'm being defensive. So to cover my stuff, I got to expose you. And then E, P-R-I-D-E, -E, e is envy. Jealous of you. Most of your critics are jealous of you. You don't invest that much attention in somebody you ain't jealous of. Wait a minute, you done, wait a minute, you done studied all that about me? You done figured out, you done went and did all that research on me? You know more about me than my mama knows. How in the world did you invest that much attention in looking me up? Why are you following me on social media? You don't even like me. Why do I look up and see you a follower of me? Because you all, you, you all up in my, because you're jealous. So you're trying to keep up with my every move. Listen, don't act, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's me. I'm saying that's somebody. You, you, the person that's envious of you is, is wanting to know as much as they can know about you because they are jealous of you. And then they take all the information they can get and they use it against you because they're trying to destroy you because they're jealous of you. I never, you know, let, me, let me speak for somebody. You never acted any different when you showed up at work that day. You didn't act any different when you showed up at their church that day. You've been the same. You've always been. And now all of a sudden is somebody saying, oh, she thinks she's all that since she, since she got that promotion. I'm acting the way I've always acted. I haven't changed anything. I always stopped by and offered, you know, you a cup of coffee. And I'm doing the same thing after the promotion. I don't know why they're going around talking about I've changed since I got my promotion. I didn't change. And you know in your heart you didn't change. You didn't change. That person got jealous. And their jealousy is trying to be, is leading them to be critical of you because they want to tear you down because you got something they want. Critical condition. As I repeat them five things, I'm like, I, I, I know I needed that. Amen. Let's get back here. Let me show you what's happening here. So they go back or, or, and, and they tell their, their, their other Gentiles, I'm sorry, the other uh, disciples that they had ministered to Gentiles. And they were like, verse 3, 
you went into men uncircumcised? You did what? You ate with them? Here we go. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them saying. And verse 5 is like reading chapter 10, verse 1, because he's going to go right back through the whole thing just as it was in order. Everybody see that? Now, uh, let's do this in verse number uh, 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, here we go, what was I? that I could withstand God. Now, I want to make sure we get this, and I may have to spend a few minutes. I know y'all are about at 8 o'clock out. We've got to break that habit. But, 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 but watch this, because I don't want to be done if the Holy Ghost is not done. And I'm not saying that, just be saying it. I mean, I'm being real, because I, I don't want to ever get outside what the Holy Spirit's wanting to say. So, no, notice here, this last statement in verse 17. I, I, want, I want us to see it. If you're one that writes in your Bibles, underline that. What was I that I could withstand God? So, but wait a minute, Peter. Why would you want to withstand God in this? Why would you not want someone that doesn't look like you to receive the greatest gift ever given? See, if, if you look at the question, the question pierces the heart or the root of the issue that the Lord was trying to resolve in Peter. When, when God says, I'm not a respecter of persons, don't be envious of my gift on that person and think that that was supposed to only have come to you. See, notice what he just said. He, he said, the Holy Ghost fell on them just like it did us. The Holy Ghost came in just like he did us. Had they walked with Jesus for three and a half years? No. Had, had, had they had their lives threatened for preaching the gospel? No. Were they there when Jesus was taken away into custody? No. Were they here in the upper room waiting for them uh, 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 10 days in isolation? No. Had they been in prison for preaching? No. And now they're going to get the same gift as we did, but they didn't go through the school of hard knocks like we did, and all of a sudden they just going to get it in their house? Do you know we had to go through to get it? We were all assembled with 3,000 others on the day of Pentecost to get this. We went through a lot to get this, and they just going to get it in their house at a potluck dinner? See, Peter is addressing the, the, the heart of man and the bias of man that would, that would resist someone else receiving a gift that hadn't been through all the same backstory that Peter had been through. And, 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 and not even, not even um, calculating that these are Gentiles. And not even Jew. And they're just going to walk in this salvation. He said, but who was I that I would withstand God? Now, I got one other verse to show you after we finish this and we'll be done. I got I to get all this out. I'm going to be out next week, so we, we got to get all this out. Well, watch this in verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace. So they had some issues. See it? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, here we go, 
Then hath God also to the Gentiles. Then God also to the Gentiles. Look at there. Then God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now you look at here. We thought he was just doing this for us. He done mess around and done this for the Gentiles. Now when they were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenice, and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of, of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were gone to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. The Jews are getting, some folk went and preached some Jews, some folk went further, reached the Gentiles, verse 21. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. That's good news. Hallelujah. Now, I, I want to show you something that Jesus said, and, and Lord willing, after that we'll be done. Go with me to Matthew chapter 20. Y'all give me a few more minutes. Man, they're having a concert, and they're they having a good time over in youth tonight. We got to go a little long. We can't let them kids get out before us. Y'all be out there waiting in the car all mad, won't know what the man preaching about him. I wish they'd come home. Yeah, I know, and it was about two years ago you was wishing they was in church. <laughs> Ain't it, no, Brother Jefferson? Yeah. Just think of all the places your youth could be tonight, and they're in church. So if you got to sit out there in the car and text somebody about the message, go on and do that. All right, watch this, Matthew chapter 20. Aren't we, you know, isn't it just like man to reject the idea that somebody's getting something easier than we got it? What is it about us that someone else's gain is interpreted as our loss? Peter literally said these words about these men receiving the greatest gift ever, which was salvation and the, and, and the Spirit of God. He literally said this. He said, who was I to withstand God? Who was I to withstand God? And, and, and when you look at that, that language there, it means who was I to stop God from giving them that gift? Now, you have to know that the Lord's no respecter of persons when he gives salvation, right? He's rich to all that call upon him. Well, then if he would give you Jesus and he's no respecter of, 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 of persons when it comes to salvation... Don't you know that every good gift comes from God? Don't you know that every good gift? You, you don't have to be jealous of someone else walking in a blessing in their life that you might not have had in yours because the same God that's blessed them can bless you and someone else's gain is not your loss. That's what the world tells us is that someone else's gain is your loss and that someone else shouldn't gain if you're losing. No, it's the same God. And so imagine, imagine if we did this. Instead of being critical and judgmental and mean-spirited to people that we just might be envious of or have no preference to, what would happen if we just said, mm, who, who am I to withstand God? Who am I to withstand God? Like, brother, the Lord did what in your life? D -d 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 Ooh. Instead of me being filled with jealousy and criticism and attack my brother for the good he just received, who am I to withstand God? Who am I to say, God, you shouldn't have blessed that man? Who am I to say, God, why did you show your goodness to that man? He's the same father and he's rich to all that call upon him in faith and he can move any way he wants to move. And just because he moved in someone else's life one way doesn't mean he was doing me wrong when he moved it the way he moved in my life. Let me show it to you. Matthew chapter 20. This will challenge him. We'll be done. Matthew 20. We'll look at it starting in verse number one. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder which went out early in the morning, early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. He said the kingdom's like this. Somebody got up real early to go hire some folk that wanted to work. I worked for my dad in construction for many years, and he was a contractor. I was a laborer, 
and you'd have these guys show up about 9 or 10 in the morning all dressed up, clean, for a job. My dad would never hire them. And I'd hear my daddy say, that man don't want to work. And I said, Daddy, he, he showed up with an application. He said, no, nah, he don't work. He said, our work day started at 7 a.m. Man want to work, get here before 7 he said, man, a man that wants a job in construction shows up before seven, dressed, ready to work, to take the guy's place that didn't show up. I heard my daddy say that many times. And I watched him hire men like that too, show up ready to work before seven. He said, come on here. I'm tired of this boy not showing up. One time that was me. No, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> I knew my, my dad knew me. They were the hard man, man. I got to show up. But he was looking at these, these clean cats walking up mid-morning. Oh, yes, I'd like to. My dad never hired him. You just want me to fill out some paper. Mm -mm. So these folks got there early to get the job. All right? So imagine you getting up early to get the job. You got up early to get the job. Y'all with me? Everybody understand what I'm saying to you? You got up early to get the job. Brother Griffin, I see you back there nodding. You got it, don't you, brother? That's, that's a hardworking man right there. All right? Uh, uh, he, he knows what I'm talking about. Verse 2. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So they all agreed. They got there early, wanted the, wanted the job. I'm going to give you a penny a day. Let's go to work. Boom. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. And again, he went out the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and said to them, Hey, man, what you doing sitting here idle? You want a job? That's what we need to be saying in Shreveport, man. Isn't that like nobody's showing up for work no more? Everywhere you go, I keep, I keep seeing all these for hire signs. Like, man, is nobody working? Have y'all noticed that too? Am I the only one? Like, I'm having managers tell me. I had a manager stop me the other day. He said, Would you pray for me? I said, hey, What do we need to pray for? He said, Pray for people that want to work. Everybody want to stay home. He said, they make more staying home than they come to work. He said, we're having a hard time. That's the world we're living in. So anyway, they went out and found these folk that wasn't working and said, hey, man, you want to come make some money? Yeah, I'll make some money. And they went to work. And whatever is right, verse 7, that will you receive. So when the evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, call the laborers and give them their hire. Beginning from the first unto the last. Or, I'm sorry, the last to the first. <laughs> so that meant them folk that got their last got paid first. You know, there was some folk mad about that. <laughs> what? I got here first. That man gonna get his check before me. So Peter sees the Holy Ghost fall on Gentiles, didn't know none. They couldn't name a prophet. They couldn't name who led the children of Israel out of Egypt. They didn't know the difference between Moses and Noah. They had not been in God's nation. They were not God's people. They weren't there at the cross. They weren't there the night in the Garden of Gethsemane. They weren't there on the day of Pentecost. You had not hid in the upper room. You've not been in prison for preaching and up in your house eating potluck. The Holy Ghost is going to fall on you. It's too easy. But then Peter said what? Who am I to withstand God? Are y'all feeling this? Because man, we'll go through something. It'll take half our life. And we'll look around and somebody else did, did what we, it took us 13 years and they like, oh, whoa, hey. Oh, where in the world did you get that car? I bought it. When? Oh, I bought it, you know, right? Uh, uh, I think it was the week after I graduated. Week after you graduated? Do you know I worked 13 years after I graduated before I ever got a new car? And then they come over to your house. What? Where did you get that big color TV? Oh, we got it at the Best Buy. When? Oh, we got it about a week or so ago. How long y'all been married? Three months. Three months. My wife and I were married for 10 years before I ever got a color TV. <laughs> Mr. Aaron's laughing. He's relating. 
My point is, is we don't like folk getting stuff quicker. Mm -mm, you got to go through the school of hard knock like I did. So he started with the ones that got there last. He said, start from the one that got there last. They didn't pay the one that got there first. I want the one that got there last to see. I want the one that got there first to see what I'm going to pay the one that got there last. It's a setup. Verse 9, and when they that came were hired about the 11th hour, they received a penny. Ooh, no, you didn't get that many been there an hour. I've been working here since this morning, and you don't give that man the same money you gave me. Who's doing the talking here? Jesus. This is a parable of Jesus. He's trying to teach us something. Oh, man, they didn't like that at all. Verse 10, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny, but they thought they ought to get more. Verse 11, and when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, these last have wrought but one hour and has made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered of one of them and said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a penny? Take what's yours and go your way. And I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is your eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. This is a picture of the kingdom. There are going to be people that are going to be in heaven. They got saved in the 11th hour. They got saved right before the rapture. They got saved on their deathbed, and you served the Lord your whole life. You can't get to heaven and say, what? I know he ain't here. Uh-uh. No, no, no. He can't be here. Uh-uh. Curse me out for going to church. Never would listen. When did you get saved, man? <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's right before I die. Right before you die. <laughs> I gave up this and gave up that and lived this away. And you live like a heathen your whole life and accept the Lord on your deathbed. Lord, I need a bigger heaven, a brighter heaven, a, a better heaven than the one he gets. See, that was the same spirit that was in Peter when he said, who was out to withstand God? If that's what God chose to do for Cornelius, then, then that was God's prerogative. And, and who am I to make God uh, uh, evil because of my own pr uh, prejudice, because of my own preference, because of my own bias, because of my own jealousy? I, I shouldn't be judging my life by another. I shouldn't be looking at another's life and then looking at mine. I shouldn't get caught in this comparison jealousy, uh, you know, a comparison trap of jealousy. Mind my own business. My life is between me and God. Someone else's gain is not my loss, and my loss is not their gain. Th this is what Jesus is teaching in his word, but this is what is plaguing society. Last verse. It's 820. It's got to be the last verse. All right, watch this. Go with me to Ecclesiastes 4. This will be the last. If, you, if, you, if you're too tired to turn there. Well, Pastor, I'm weary in hearing. All right, but just, just listen. Ecclesiastes 4. Verse 4. Again, I mean, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 4. Again, I considered all travail, pain, pain. And every right work that for this a man is envied of his neighbor, this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. Verse 6, better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with pain and vexation of spirit. So what does that mean? That means when you envy what belongs to another, hear me now, I'm going to close. 
When you envy another man, when you envy another person, it doesn't matter how full your hands are, you're not content. When you envy another person, no matter how full your hands are, that's what it's saying here, you're still vexed because you're judging your life by looking at another. And you'll never find contentment. So God says it's better that your hands just be empty and you not even judge your life by that of another. At least you'll have peace. Amen. So if you can't have your hands full without being jealous of other people, then maybe it's best that your hands not be full. Why have it and not enjoy it? Because you're weighing it against someone else. Preference. Jealousy above anything else. Now, I, am, I, I, I assure you I'm closing. <laughs> Jealousy above anything else is a fear of a loss of preference. I saw you looking at her. Who? You know who I'm talking about. I'm looking, I'm looking at everybody. I'm looking at everybody walk through that door. I done seen everybody. I saw that dude over there and that crazy lady right there. I mean, I don't seen everybody. <laughs> no, you looking at her. See, the, the jealousy is I've, I've lost, I'm no longer your preferred one. You preferred, you prefer her over me, jealousy. No one wants to lose preference. Now, let's be real. Nobody wants to lose preference. We want to be preferred. We don't want to audition and didn't get it. And somebody else auditioned, they did. We sitting there like. <laughs> Can't sing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, this is so true. We deal with this. If we're, if, we're, if we're honest, we don't want to be not the one that was preferred. He took who to lunch? And then like the third time this year, he's invited him to lunch. That's what I thought. Shoot, he ain't invited me to lunch. See, preference. God doesn't have a preference. Amen. It means if you see the goodness of God on another man's life, the goodness of God can come on your life. He's no respect your persons. He's not preferring you over me. He's so good that even if you come in last, he's going to bless you because he's just that good. You can't be mad at God because you got there early and the other guy got there late and the other guy got the goodness of God too. He's just that good. Amen. Jealousy becomes envy when you feel pain in the sight of someone else's happiness. So let's challenge our heart. Do you feel pain when someone else seems preferred? Your jealousy is turning to envy. Envy says whatever you have has actually cost me. Therefore, you shouldn't have it because it wasn't fair that I didn't get it. Mm. Envy wants to destroy the person it's jealous of. And so what does the enemy do in our world? I'm, 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 I'm right there done. I'm not like I see the checkered flag. The world and the spirit of this age the God of this world wants to always highlight the difference. Because if you constantly highlight the difference, you set people apart. You magnify the difference. We should not be magnifying the difference. That divides. Like I said to you last week, if I got up here in this pulpit week after week after week after week, I'm always talking about Chevy, 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 and ain't nothing like a Chevy, 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 Chevy. You're the Chevy people are like, man, that man, look, that pastor right there, man, he gets it. I'm a Chevy man too. Used to work at GM. But then the four people are like, I can't take no more of this Chevy stuff. <laughs> but you can't be always magnifying the difference. 
It, it only separates. And so our world wants to magnify the difference, only to divide. And so everywhere we look, everything's white or black. Everything's got to be based on skin color. And all it's doing is dividing people. Then you walk into a store and you didn't even have that bias. And now you find yourself walking into it because that's all the world is screaming. Well, that's racism. That's racism. It may be racism, but I'm not a racist. And we can't let this world's propaganda infect us with, with a spirit that makes us a, a part of the problem. Jesus has called us to be a part of the solution. And he's good to all. And nobody can call on him. He won't say that's where I got to live my life. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm done. Amen. Boom. There's a flag. Let me pray with you and pray for you tonight. Thank you for hanging out. I know it went a little, went a little long, but this, this, I just felt needed to be said. Father, we thank you for your word. And I pray, Father, in this atmosphere and in this moment, that, Lord, if there be anything in us that generates bias, prejudice, preference, that, Lord, if it's in our heart, that you'd expose it. Father, I pray that the divisiveness that's in this world would not infect your church. That we would see truly that to be a respecter of persons is sin. And Father, would you use us and give us that word of reconciliation. That we can go out just as the early disciples did and preach to Jew and Gentile. Knowing that with God there is no respecter of persons. Jesus name I invite you to pray with me Heavenly Father I acknowledge your gift of salvation is without bias but that you are rich to all who call upon you in faith and that Jesus died for all that all could be saved and I believe you died for my sins and that you were raised from the dead that I could walk in newness of life and that you sent your spirit to live in me, to empower me, to advance your kingdom and to live this life for your glory. So as I walk out of this place tonight, I ask that your spirit would keep me in remembrance of what I've heard. And when the spirit of jealousy, envy, preference, prejudice rises in me, be quick to convict me. In Jesus' name, amen.